Hello my friends, and welcome back to the You Can Do TV channel. Dry docking is a crucial maintenance and repair procedure in the maritime industry, designed to ensure the seaworthiness and longevity of ships. This process involves taking the entire vessel out of the water and placing it on dry land to facilitate a thorough inspection, cleaning, and repair of various ship components. The primary goal of dry docking is to address any issues that may have arisen during the ship's service at sea, ranging from routine maintenance tasks to major structural repairs. The dry docking process typically unfolds in a series of well-defined steps to ensure that the ship is in optimal condition when it returns to the water. One of the initial tasks is to clean the hull of the ship, which often accumulates marine growth such as algae, barnacles, and other aquatic organisms during its time in the water. These organisms can increase drag and reduce fuel efficiency, so cleaning the hull is a vital step. Additionally, hull inspection and repairs are essential components of the dry docking process. This involves a detailed examination of the ship's exterior and interior structures to identify any signs of wear, damage, or corrosion. If any issues are discovered, they are addressed promptly to prevent further deterioration and ensure the vessel's safety. After cleaning, the ship's hull is treated with anti-corrosive and anti-fouling paints. Anti-corrosive coatings protect the metal structure of the hull from rust and corrosion caused by exposure to seawater, while anti-fouling paints discourage the attachment of marine organisms, helping to maintain the ship's performance and fuel efficiency. Anchor chains, another vital component of a ship's equipment, undergo thorough examination, cleaning, and remarking to ensure their integrity and reliability. Shipside gratings, which provide ventilation and access to compartments within the ship, are also cleaned and repaired as needed during dry docking. Cleaning and surveying of tanks, including fuel and water tanks, are carried out to ensure they are free of contaminants and safe for use. The ship's propulsion system is a critical area of focus during dry docking. This includes inspecting the rudder and carrier ring, examining clearances and locking devices, overhauling all overboard and sea suction valves, and checking the wear and tear of tail shaft bearings. The tail shaft itself is removed and meticulously inspected for any signs of damage or stress. This comprehensive examination helps identify and address potential issues that could compromise the ship's performance and safety at sea. The MV Mariner, navigating through the intricate canal waters, recently faced a critical situation that demanded swift emergency repairs to ensure its safe passage and continued operation. Mech shipyards, renowned for their expertise in maritime repairs and maintenance, rose to the occasion, executing a series of essential tasks to restore the vessel's integrity. The emergency repairs included extensive steel repairs to rectify structural weaknesses caused by wear and tear from years of maritime service. Mech Shipyard's skilled workforce meticulously assessed and addressed these issues, reinforcing the vessel's overall structural integrity. One of the key tasks undertaken by mech shipyards was the cropping and renewal of a section of the transom plate. 
This critical repair ensured that the MV Mariner's bow remained resilient against the challenges posed by the canal waters, safeguarding it from potential accidents or damage. Additionally, mech shipyards took measures to crop and renew a section of the side shell plating, further fortifying the vessel's hull and enhancing its ability to navigate safely through the demanding canal environment. The MS Zondam, a renowned cruise ship, underwent a significant engineering operation in Uruguay. The task at hand was no small feat. A crankshaft exchange, this intricate procedure was executed by Ale, a company known for its expertise in heavy lifting and transportation. Preparation is key. Before the actual exchange could take place, a week of rigorous preparation was undertaken. This involved ensuring that all necessary equipment was on hand, and that the team was ready for the task, Ale had quick response crates, always primed for deployment. These crates contained essential tools and equipment, ensuring that everything needed was within arm's reach. To ensure the safety and stability of the operation, pad eyes and lifting frames were used. These tools reinforced the existing structures of the ship, providing additional support where needed. Moreover, reference points indicating the original position of the engine were marked. This would be crucial for the accurate placement of the new crankshaft. Specialized equipment for a specialized task. Given the uniqueness of the operation, specialized equipment was required. Jacking brackets, specifically designed for this type of engine, were employed. Additionally, lifting brackets played a pivotal role in both lowering the old crankshaft and lifting the new one into position. To ensure that the system was ready for the task, a system test was conducted using 60 T-Jacks and electrical HPUs. This test ensured that all equipment was functioning optimally and that the team was prepared for the actual operation. The arrival and installation. The new crankshaft, sourced from Montevideo, Uruguay, arrived ready for installation. Its entry into the ship was through the maintenance hatch, a passage that led directly to the engine room. From there, it was a journey of lowering the crankshaft several decks down into the heart of the ship. The need for replacement. The old crankshaft of the MS Zondam had seen better days, it had suffered damage due to wear at its bearing points, such wear, if left unattended, could lead to significant operational issues and potential hazards. Recognizing the urgency, the decision was made to replace the old crankshaft with a new one, weighing a substantial 7.5 tons.
One of the most critical steps was the jacking up of the engine block to the required height. This step ensured that there was enough space to remove the old crankshaft and place the new one. Once the old crankshaft was removed, it was set aside for refurbishment, ensuring that no part went to waste. In the refurbishing process, the crankshaft is thoroughly inspected to identify areas of wear, especially at the bearing points. Advanced diagnostic tools are employed to detect any underlying issues or deformities. Once identified, precision machining techniques are used to remove damaged layers, followed by grinding to smoothen out the surface. Polishing ensures the removal of any residual imperfections, restoring the crankshaft's original luster and functionality. Heat treatments might be applied to strengthen the metal and enhance its durability. The refurbished crankshaft then undergoes rigorous testing to ensure it meets industry standards and can handle the demands of a ship's engine. This entire process not only extends the life of the crankshaft, but also promotes sustainability by reducing the need for new materials and conserving resources. Before the installation of the new crankshaft, a last-minute risk assessment was conducted. This step was crucial to ensure that all potential hazards were identified and mitigated. With the green light given, the new 7.5T crankshaft was skidded into its designated position. The precision with which the new crankshaft was placed was awe-inspiring. It was lifted into the bearing with utmost care, ensuring that there was minimal displacement of the engine block. The team then began the process of jacking down the engine block, a step that required immense precision.
to ensure that the crankshaft was perfectly aligned, brackets were installed. These brackets played a pivotal role in ensuring that the engine block was accurately positioned, with a margin of error of less than one millimeter. Such precision is a testament to the expertise of the AIL team and the meticulous planning that went into the operation. The Elbe ship, a powerful seagoing tug, holds a significant place in maritime history. Constructed in 1957 for Smith International, this vessel has witnessed various roles and served on multiple fronts, from towing ships across the Atlantic to becoming the flagship of Greenpeace. However, as time took its toll, the Elbe was in dire need of restoration to ensure its legacy would continue to sail the seas. In 2009, a massive project was undertaken to restore this historical vessel to its original 1959 condition. This article delves into the intricate process of bringing the Elbe back to life, focusing on key restoration aspects such as the riveting process, disassembling and maintaining critical components, hull cleaning and refurbishing, and the final stages of painting and dry docking. Riveting process. The riveting process is a crucial step in ship restoration, ensuring the vessel's structural integrity. This intricate procedure involves the creation of steel rivets, which are used to fasten various components of the ship's hull. The Elbe's restoration team started by cutting steel bars into precise lengths to create the rivets. These rivets were then heated to red-hot temperatures, making them malleable and ready for use. Skilled craftsmen used rivet hammers to secure the rivets, pressing them into place while they were still hot. This riveting process is a labor-intensive and precise operation, requiring experienced hands to guarantee the strength and stability of the ship's structure. It harkens back to a time when ships were built with meticulous attention to detail and craftsmanship. The Elbe's restoration team spared no effort to recreate the original riveting process, ensuring that the ship would stand the test of time once more. The Elbe, originally completed in February 1959 at the renowned J. N. K. Schmidt's shipyard in Kinderdijk, marked a significant milestone during a period of rapid growth for Schmidt International. Measuring 58.09 meters in length overall, 
with a beam of 11.23 meters and a depth of 5.02 meters, this vessel was powered by two Smith Mann six-cylinder, four-stroke diesel main engines, collectively generating an impressive 2,780 shaft horsepower. These engines drove a single open propeller through a reverse reduction gearbox, propelling the Elbe through its illustrious maritime career. Processing ship hulls and component maintenance. In addition to the riveting process, the Elbs hull required extensive attention during its restoration. The restoration team meticulously disassembled and maintained critical components such as anchors, steering systems, and propellers. These components play a pivotal role in the ship's functionality, and their careful restoration was essential to ensure the vessel's seaworthiness anchors, which are essential for ship stability and safety, underwent thorough inspections, repairs, and maintenance. Steering systems were overhauled to ensure precise control of the vessel, and propellers were refurbished to optimize propulsion efficiency. This comprehensive approach ensured that the Elbe would not only look the part, but also function impeccably upon completion. Cleaning the hull, high pressure cleaning, rust removal, and paint stripping. To restore the Elbe to its former glory, the ship's hull required meticulous cleaning and refurbishment. High pressure cleaning was employed to remove years of accumulated grime, barnacles, and marine growth from the hull. This process prepared the surface for further restoration work. Rust removal was a critical step in the hull cleaning process. Rust can compromise a ship's structural integrity so it was imperative to eradicate it entirely. Specialized techniques and equipment were used to remove rust, leaving the hull in pristine condition. The final step in preparing the hull was paint stripping. Layers of old paint were carefully removed to reveal the ship's original surface. This uncovered the Elbe's authentic appearance, setting the stage for the next phase of restoration. Preparing for new paint. After thorough cleaning and rust removal, the Elbe was ready for a fresh coat of paint. The application of paint is not merely cosmetic. It also provides protection against corrosion and the harsh elements of the sea. Skilled painters meticulously applied layers of marine-grade paint, ensuring that the ship would withstand the rigors of its future journeys.
Welding and patching damaged ship hull areas. The restoration process also entailed welding and patching damaged areas of the ship's hull. Over the years, the Elbe had encountered wear and tear, resulting in various imperfections. Skilled welders and shipyard workers meticulously addressed these issues, reinforcing the hull and patching any weakened sections. Painting the hull and completion of the repair process. The final step in the restoration journey of the Elbe was painting the hull. A fresh coat of paint not only enhanced the ship's aesthetics, but also provided vital protection against the corrosive effects of salt water and the elements. The Elbe's iconic black and white livery was faithfully restored, paying homage to its historical legacy. With the completion of the repair process and a gleaming new coat of paint, the Elbe was finally ready to return to the water. It had been a laborious journey that spanned many years, but the dedication and expertise of the restoration team had breathed new life into this seagoing legend. The restoration of the Elbe ship stands as a testament to the determination and passion of those committed to preserving maritime history. The intricate riveting process, the careful disassembly and maintenance of critical components, the thorough cleaning and refurbishment of the hull, and the meticulous painting and patching efforts all played a crucial role in bringing this seagoing legend back to life. The Elbe now serves as a living testament to the craftsmanship of the past and a symbol of maritime heritage, ready to embark on new adventures and continue its storied journey on the open seas. In this part, let's watch the video on piston overhaul process presented by Man Energy Solutions, focusing on engine types, MC. Remove the door to the crankcase. Turn the crosshead down far enough to give access to the piston rod stuffing box and the screws for the piston rod. Release the stuffing box by removing the innermost screws for stuffing box flange. Remove the screws from the piston rod. Mount the two distance pieces on the piston rod foot to protect the lower scraper ring and to guide the stuffing box. Make a scratch mark in liner and piston cleaning ring to ensure the correct mounting.
remove the piston cleaning ring. Carefully remove any wear ridges at the top of the cylinder liner. See procedure 9031. Turn the crosshead towards top dead center while checking that the stuffing box lands correctly on the distance pieces. Turn to top dead center. The top of the piston is now free of the cylinder liner. Clean the lifting groove of the piston crown. Mount the lifting tool in such a manner that the two fixed claws of the tool fit into the lifting groove of the piston. Fit the third adjustable claw and tighten it up against the stop of the tool. See data 1021. Lift the piston out of the cylinder liner. Lower the piston rod foot and stuffing box through the opening in the platform. Place the two halves of the support around the piston rod and secure the two halves with screws. Land the piston on the support. Remove the lifting tool from the piston crown. Place a cover over the opening for the piston rod stuffing box in the bottom of the cylinder liner. See procedure 9031. Before dismantling the piston rings, measure the free ring gap of all the piston rings. Take off the piston rings by means of the ring expander. Clean and inspect the rings and measure the radial width of the rings. Note down the results. See the instruction book, Volume 1, Chapter 707.
clean the piston crown. Check the ring grooves. The maximum vertical height in a worn ring groove must not exceed the value stated in the data sheet. Check the burn away by means of the template. For maximum permissible burn away value, see data sheet 1021. Mount the piston rings with the top mark upwards and the ring gap staggered 180 degrees. Lift the piston with the lifting tool. Land the piston rod foot on a wooden plank. During the lift, follow with the crane to keep the crane positioned vertically above the lifting point. Lower the piston crown to the platform and land it on a wooden plank so that it's possible to remove the lifting tool. Remove the lifting tool. Mount the lifting bracket to the bottom of the piston rod foot. Hook the crane onto the lifting bracket Lift the piston rod clear of the wooden plank. Keep lifting until the piston rod is in a vertical position. Yeah. 
dismount the locking wire and the innermost screws between the rod and the piston crown. Lift the piston rod away. Remove the screws in the skirt. And mount two eye bolts in the holes intended for dismantling screws. Lift the skirt away. Clean and inspect all parts of the piston. Remove the sealing ring on the piston rod. Remove the sealing ring from the piston skirt. Mount a new sealing ring on the piston skirt coated with lubricating oil. Mount the piston skirt. Coat all screws with molybdenum disulfide and mount the screws in the skirt. Remove the eye bolts. Clean the piston rod. Mount two guide screws in the piston crown to ensure correct mounting. Mount a new sealing ring on the piston rod coated with lubricating oil. Install the piston rod into the piston crown. Coat all screws with molybdenum disulfide and mount the screws.
tighten all the screws diagonally. See datasheet 1021. Lock all the screws with locking wire. Mount the locking wire in such a way that the wire is tightened if one of the screws works loose. See procedure 9137. Dismount the lifting bracket from the piston rod foot. Fill the piston and piston rod with lubricating oil. Mount the pressure testing tool around the base of the piston rod. Pressure test the piston at the pressure stated on the data sheet. Check the contact surfaces of the piston and the sealing rings for tightness. Release the pressure. Remove the pressure testing tool. Mount the lifting tool on the piston crown. Remove the support tool from the piston.
Remove the cover from the piston rod stuffing box opening in the bottom of the cylinder unit. Remove the protective rubber cover from the crosshead. Clean the piston rod. Coat the stuffing box sealing ring with grease. Lubricate the piston rod with lubricating oil. Mount the guide ring for piston rings on the cylinder liner. Lower the piston into the cylinder liner. Lubricate the piston rings with lubricating oil. Guide the piston rod foot through the cutout in the stuffing box flange. and land the piston rod foot on the top of the crosshead. Sorry. Remove the lifting tool from the piston crown and the guide ring from the cylinder liner. Coat the top of the piston with lubricating oil. Turn the piston down. Remove the distance pieces from the piston rod foot Mount the innermost screws in the stuffing box flange. And tighten to the specified torque. See data sheet 1021. Mount and tighten the piston rod screws. Tighten the screws to the specified torque and lock the screws with locking wire. See procedure 9137. Mount the piston cleaning ring according to the scratch marks.